Compassion matters. But I think you know that already. Because when your life is filled with compassion, love, laughter and friendship, you know what that feels like. And you know when it's absent. And in particular, I mention compassion first because it's very difficult to establish love, laughter and friendship if the person you're talking to you doesn't actually care for your welfare. And you can think about those moments in your life when you hold your baby for the first time or you hold your children's hand or you kiss the person you love or even in those light moments where you go down the shop and you talk to somebody that you've not met before and you think, what a nice person. I worked uh, as a palliative care physician and in all of my working life I never ever had once somebody say to me, I wish I'd spent more time at work. And the thing that impressed me most of all was those people who came to the end of their life and they said, I've had a good life. I've had good family and friends. I have no regrets. So what does the science tell us? Well, this is a, a, a chart showing the impact of different interventions on our risk of dying. And uh, as you can see, second from the bottom, is the drug treatment of high blood pressure. And happily for us, if we have our high blood pressure treated, it actually does decrease our risk of dying. But you can see that the top three bars, which are social relationships, absolutely dwarf the impact of treatment of high blood pressure. In fact, social relationships are more effective than giving up smoking, drinking, diet and exercise, and practically everything else we care to mention. Susan Pinker, in her TED Talk and uh, in her book, The Village Effect, describes how from cradle to the grave, we spend huge amounts of effort learning about and developing social relationships. And in this amazing talk by Robert Waldinger, he describes a 75-year study into happiness in which from 1938 onwards, a cohort of men were tracked on an annual basis and they had various measurements done of this and that, whatever was popular at the time. Uh, and uh, the findings, the outcomes of this study are that social relationships are absolutely crucial to health and well-being and longevity. And it's not just the number of social relationships, it's actually the quality of those relationships. And uh, it's not just in our behaviour as well, because it's in our biochemistry and in particular in our hormone cascades that are associated with it. And in those moments of joy and harmony and compassion, you can measure the so-called socialising hormone oxytocin. And when you look, oxytocin's not found just in humans, it's found throughout the animal kingdom. You can see examples of compassion and care wherever you look in the animal kingdom, and there are some great examples in a book called Mama's Last Hug. And human beings, the most social of animals, have compassion as we have compassion as part of our evolution. There's another book called How Compassion Made Us Human. It's actually part of our survival. And in my opinion, the term survival of the fittest is really not great. And perhaps we should be saying survival of the most compassionate. But from a clinician's perspective, it does beg the question about can we make use of this magic of compassion and social relationships in a clinical setting to try and improve people's health and well-being? Well, let's have a look at the type of people that typically turn up in a GP surgery uh, in the morning. And this is uh, taken from an article written by Dr. Anne Robinson, uh, who described the people who turned up at her surgery on the morning prior to writing the article. And when you read it, you can see that there's an awful lot in there which makes you think social isolation, loneliness. This might be something 
that is suitable to a compassionate community approach. And we can go to the market town of Froome in Somerset in the southwest of England where we can find some kind of an answer. And we have to thank these two amazing people. On the left-hand side is Jenny Hartnell, and on the right-hand side is Dr. Helen Kingston. And Jenny has a background in community development and instituted a compassionate program throughout the community of Froome. And Helen uh, did something similar in drawing together the, the medical resources of, uh, around Froome medical practice. And let's have a peek at her her original motivation. And as you can see, she had a model of medicine which actually didn't mention ill health. Rather, she looked at ways that people could support each other and looked at how professional services, health and social care, could integrate to help that whole process. Now, I'd like to describe to you all the different things that went on in Froome, but, but we've only got a short amount of time. So I've selected two. Uh, two examples, one about what's gone on in the community and the other related to what happens when somebody gets ill. So the first example is uh, when Jenny first arrived in Froome, uh, started working there. She mapped all the stuff that's going on in the community. And when they, whenever human beings get together, they do stuff together. And it doesn't matter whether it's a knit and natter group or a choir or a sports club or a healthy walking group, whatever it is. Uh, and and Jenny put these literally hundreds of groups onto a service directory which is easily accessible on the internet. But quite a few people said to her, Jenny, I don't want to belong to a group. I would just like to talk to people about, you know, just have a conversation. And so Jenny thought, oh, great, uh, I'll start a talking cafe. And so on a Monday morning, you can go down the cheese and grain and there are some tables set aside where you can just go and chat. And the next thing that Jenny thought was, well, we got the service directory, we got the talking cafes, why don't I set a program of training the people in Froome to know how to access these resources? Because she believed that if you give people the opportunity to help people, they will do that automatically. So she started up this program of... Uh, what she called community connector training, anything between, um, between 20 minutes and two hours. And um, so far in Froome, 600 people have been trained. We know that they have a, a conversation about what's going on about 20 times a year. And it doesn't matter whether they're cafe owners, taxi drivers, receptionists, people in libraries. Anyone can be a community connector. Well. 20 conversations a year, 600 people, that's 12,000 conversations a year in a town of 28,000 people. 12,000 moments of little beacons of compassion, talking about how the people of Froome can support the people of Froome. The other example I'm going to give you is Kathy. Kathy is a 50 year old businesswoman, very active, who was diagnosed with uh, acute rheumatoid arthritis. It was extremely severe. And within the space of three weeks, she ended up in a wheelchair. So she went to her GP uh, and she said, Rob, I need a sense of hope about that my life is, is going to be more than how I'm feeling right now. And I would really like to meet other people who are going through similar kinds of experiences. So Rob said, well, why don't you go and see Rose? So Rose is a health connector, somebody who works in Jenny's team on a one-to-one -one basis. And Rose went to see Kathy in a home because Kathy was struggling to get out because of the severity of her rheumatoid arthritis. And Rose said, I know, why don't you go to the self-management program, which is a six-week program to help people manage their disease. So off Kathy went, and of course, she was greeted by a group of people with compassion and care and friendship. And from the self-management program, she went to the on-track group, and from the on-track group, she went to the exercise group, and from the exercise group, she went out into the community and was open to the vast resources of things going on in the community. And you can see Kathy in this uh, illustration 
where she's in the orange jumper and she moves from the medical center out into the community. And let's hear from Kathy to see what she felt she learned about the experience of her illness. I'm now going out into the community and talking about my experience and also being able to then signpost people who may be in a similar situation to where I was 18 months ago and actually showing them that, that there is hope, they're not alone, that there are people out here who are willing to work with them, help with them, become their friends. And that's, I think that's the most important thing I've learned is that, you know, people who go through similar experiences become lifelong friends. I've met so many people and I've made so many friends that, you know, I'll be there for them and they'll be there for me. So Kathy, through the experience of her illness, is introduced to her compassionate community. So we were interested to find out whether, uh, whether this made any difference to uh, health outcomes, all that had gone on in Froome. So we looked at whole population emergency admissions of Froome compared to the, the population of Somerset, which is a, a, a county of 500,000 people. And we were flabbergasted to find that emergency admissions in Froome over a four-year period had gone down by 15%, whilst at the same time, in Somerset, they'd gone up by 30%. And we knew the significance of this because there are no interventions ever which have reduced population emergency admissions. Just to give it some kind of context, if there was a tablet that could reduce emergency emissions by up to 30%, this would be an absolute medical miracle. And yet, it's not a tablet, it's compassionate communities. But to me, even more interesting than these, the possibility of a new branch of medicine, of compassionate communities, are the implications. And the implications are that as human beings, we are the outcome of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And compassion has been an important part of our survival. We carry with us this compassionate potential. It's a treasure that is open to us wherever we are, whether we're in our homes, in our communities, doesn't matter, everywhere. And in addition to this treasure, we have the power of choice. We can choose to be more compassionate. So, the science tells us that compassion, love, laughter, and friendship helps us to live longer, be healthier, and happier. Imagine if in your town, everyone chose to be a bit more compassionate than they already are. Imagine if the 7.7 .7 billion people of the world chose to be a bit more compassionate than they already are. So please, be kind. It makes a difference. Thank you.